Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And thank you, mu thank you so much for joining us uh, in this video devoted to our advanced practice providers, namely the nurse practitioners and physician's assistants in the Department of Surgery. Currently here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we have approximately 100 faculty surgeons and approximately 60 uh, nurse practitioners and PAs. Today I'm lucky enough to be joined by Steve Robichon who is in the Division of Vascular Surgery and brings the outpatient perspective to the care of medicine. Um, Meg Shannon Stone who's to my right who's in the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery and functions on the, in, on the inpatient side within the hospital uh, providing care to patients uh, before and after surgery. Uh, and Sarah Masustin to my left, who's in the Division of Surgical Oncology and spends much of her time in the operating room along with uh, caring for patients post-operatively. So um, maybe I could, we could go around the room a little bit and Steve, I could start with you. Sure. And uh, certainly Meg and Sarah can give their perspective. But first of all, for the, for the patients and their families who are listening to this video, maybe the difference between a nurse practitioner and a PA and all three of you can give your perspective on what you do and, um, and you, where you think the field of, uh, of advanced practice providers is going. So, Sure. So uh, as Dr. Evans mentioned, I uh, work in the outpatient clinic for the Division of Vascular Surgery and uh, I spend a lot of my time working in conjunction with our seven surgeons to care for our patients who have either undergone a surgery and need post-operative care um, surveilling their um, chronic vascular disease, such as aneurysmal disease and carotid disease, peripheral artery disease, uh, and then also caring for wounds associated with different conditions as well. Um, I carry um, my own uh, clinic schedule, um, often still sharing the same patients that the surgeons have, but we work collaboratively to take care of them um, together and, uh, and make sure that they're achieving their, their health care goals. Um, when it comes to the specifics of the difference between a physician assistant and nurse practitioner, uh, I think when you get to the stage that we're all at, um, the lines really start to blur because um, we provide a very similar service to the patient. Uh, I think the big differences come down to, to our training. Um, uh, physician assistants generally being referred to as being trained under the medical model similar to physicians and nurse practitioners being trained under the nursing model. Um, and then there, there are some, some oversight and licensure differences from state to state um, with regards to supervision and such. But again, when it comes down to it, when you're um, talking directly to a patient and caring directly for a patient, um, the differences uh, aren't really uh, as evident. Let me, let me ask you, Steve. So for, for people, I would say, that, that are about, about my age and younger, you know, they're, they're and I, I mean non-medical people mm -hmm. probably, they're very comfortable with a nurse practitioner or a PA because that oftentimes is who they see. So for example, in my, in my year, when I go to, for a yearly checkup, I see a nurse practitioner. And then a, uh, and then a cardiologist will come in at the, end of the, at the end of the day or the half day of, of giving me all the tests that, that this old body required. And then they may summarize the results, but the physical exam and and everything was orchestrated by the nurse practitioner. Do you find that, that with, with patients who are um, of older age, say people certainly in their, in their 70s, 80s, who really never, never experienced the, the kind of the, the change in medicine that went into to the development of the team approach, do they, <coughs> do they want to be sure that you have communicated with Dr. Lewis or, or yeah. Dr. Lee, or, and maybe you could comment on that a bit. I think there is a generational um, expectation there. You know, the, the older generations, the baby boomers, um, have grown up with the mentality of um, having, you know, a primary physician sort of be the quarterback of their care. Um, and that person really is kind of uh, an all-encompassing provider. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the concept of a nurse practitioner, physician assistant is still somewhat new. I mean, the physician assistant profession's really only been around for um, 50 or 60 years. And, um, you know, with that comes a lot of education about what our role is and what, uh, what 
aspect we play with regards to the patient's care. And, and it does require, with the, with the older patients, um, some time to educate them about our abilities and our, our training, um, to reassure them that we are working um, as their physician or surgeon would, um, that we work with them so closely that we understand how they would approach things and how they would want to care for things. Um, and I, I try to explain to them that one perk of having me involved in their care is that I often can be more available to them and, uh, and able to answer uh, concerns and questions on a, uh, on, a, on a potentially on a quicker basis. So uh, I try to highlight the pluses, but help them understand that yes, it is still somewhat of a new developing role, but with the idea that we're trying to um, take care of the whole them and uh, and, and not um, and not feel as though there's one person that they have to go to. Great. So Meg, you you take care of really high acuity patients. I mean, obviously people who have had heart transplants, lung transplants, in addition to um, other big operations in cardiac and thoracic surgery. So maybe a little bit to the. Uh, I'm sure that a number of um, of young men and women who are who are either in NP or PA school or contemplating going there. I uh, would be thrilled to hear about what you do Monday through Friday. Um, so I work more as a hospitalist for the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery, and I have to say that the Division of Surgery has allowed this autonomy for me in my own division, which I know isn't everywhere. But I do feel that I'm very lucky to be working in this job and have that opportunity and you are right so I work with um, intensive care patients I do have physicians I work with directly in the intensive care unit the um, critical care physicians in conjunction with my surgeons but uh, some of the testing some of the things that come up some of the discussions with families many of the consents are with me and I try to establish a relationship with families try to find out who they are how their loved one interacts and how this is impacting them, which makes me feel like that's a big piece of it, not just the medical piece, but also getting to know these patients and these families, which I think hopefully bring, makes our service a little more personable versus just a, a, you know any old patient who came in and did that. And I don't mean any old patient in that way, but I really try to make them feel like they're different, they're special here at, at Freighter Hospital, wherever they may be. I also provide the continuity. So if I've seen them before surgery, I've seen them in the ICU, I've seen them on the floor, and then I'm doing the discharge, people feel like may, they really do know me. And I try, as Steve was saying, to let the families know that I'm in constant contact with the surgeon. It's very difficult for a surgeon to spend <coughs> the amount of time that I spend with families. They've, they need to be in the operating room doing the important surgeries, these big surgeries, and I can help by being out there. I have, I think working in the Department of Surgery, in my opinion, is one of the best places to go. I am never without a surgeon backup at any time. If I need a surgeon now, I work for seven surgeons, even if it isn't their patient, I have the ability to have a surgeon come and help. I don't know anybody else who has that kind of a safety net. Um, my surgeons, if, even if they're clinic, they'll leave clinic, they'll do all those kinds of things. Um, Steve is talking about, you were asked about the differences, I think, between advanced practice and, um, or nurse practitioners and PAs. Um, I think it's interesting that PAs came out of the medics um, the, uh, the training corps, and so that's how that started, and their education is basically, correct me if I'm wrong, the second and third year of medical school, um, which brings a very different thing than nurse practitioners because we're always nursing based. And so a lot of what I do, I feel, is adding to the nursing care of the patients. Obviously a tremendous benefit to, to patients who who get to see you throughout the length of their hospitalization. So you mentioned the analogy to a hospitalist. And <clears throat> for those uh, patients and families who are watching this and who may have had a hospital admission for a pneumonia or, or, uh, or a gastrointestinal problem that was medical and not surgical, they'll know that their hospitalist uh, typically may have worked one week, but then they would have a different hospitalist the next week. What an incredible service you provide whereby patients who have a, a heart transplant, a big heart operation, they ha since you work every week, they basically have you through the continuity of their, of their hospital stay. 
And maybe one last question for the, for the, uh, for the people who are contemplating a career as an NP or a PA. What was, do you think, what was your learning curve in CT surgery? How, obviously, you're, you're, um, you're not only one of the more experienced um, advanced practice providers here, but you're also, people should know, our chief APP in the Department of Surgery now, as, as we have approximately 60 uh, APPs between NPs and PAs. But how long did it take you to get comfortable with the medical aspects of the field of cardiothoracic surgery, do you think? Um, and that is a good point, the medical aspects, because the nursing aspects, my background was ICU and I worked with these patients in the ICU. So it definitely is the medical aspect. Mm -hmm. I think CT surgery has a very steep learning curve because we take on some of the sickest of the sick patients. Um, not just because we're a large referral center and we are with the Medical College of Wisconsin, but because that's CT surgery. Mm. Um, so uh, it had minimum two to four years before you're comfortable. And sure. fortunately, we have a lot of support. There's lots of education available. There's opportunities for continuing education that the department provides for all of us. Um, within the campus, there are <laughs> lectures from every division all the time and there's a, um, a site that we can go to and look so if we want to learn a little bit about something else whether it be nephrology or endocrine there is always opportunities yeah, here. Great. Well Sarah um, I obviously know you very well since <laughs> since we work together <coughs> excuse me but maybe you could talk a little bit about your uh, about your job and, and what sure. you do every week in surgical oncology sure. covering the gamut of, um, of pancreatic tumor surgery to endocrine and breast surgery and how you combine the operating room environment with with some of the of the post-operative care. Sure, so here at MCW we have um, a little bit of a unique role as a PA either you know you kind of function in the outpatient clinic setting or in the OR hospital setting so Steve for instance practices you know in the clinic and, and Meg of course in the hospital and I'm a little unique because I um, also will go into the operating room and, and spend a, a lot of time with you in the operating sure. room and so really I, I feel like the PAs and the NPs on the floor, really we provide some continuity of care for, for our patients and um, we're the constant so patients always know that, that we're available, especially in the midst of um, an academic institution when we have lots of residents transitioning on and off service. Um, you know, we really have a, a deep understanding, I would say, of, of what the surgeons would, would like for their patients when they're in the operating room. Um, in addition to, to being on the floor, of course, I also spend a, a majority of my time actually in the operating room and um, operating on a number of different kinds of patients, so breast patients, so uh, patients with breast cancer. Um, endocrine patients, so patients that have thyroid or parathyroid or even adrenal problems, and then uh, of course our pancreas uh, cancer patients. And so it's a, a, a pretty big assortment of patients. Sure. I think many of the, many of the patients and their families who watch this uh, video, unless they've, unless they've um, uh, uh, observed probably on, on TV, which may have varying degrees of accuracy, or in, in other videos how surgery is performed, obviously it takes, it, a, one individual usually does not perform an operation. There, you, there frequently is someone, so if I'm performing an operation, either you would be assisting me or one of my other partners or a senior resident, and then there typically would be a scrub nurse. So uh, oftentimes there are three people at the operating room table and in cardiothoracic surgery there's uh, that is largely covered by in inpatient physicians assistants who are assigned predominantly to the operating room correctly who would assist one of the one of the cardiac or thoracic surgeons with the operation but it typically takes two people to do an operation and it's one of those things where it's uh, it, it oftentimes can be um, a little bit hard to uh, to understand that un until one has seen it, but it's virtually impossible for one person to work without an assistant holding 
ho holding some traction and, yeah. and doing various other things. But I would say, and you'll, you'll probably agree, that you work with someone consistently and you develop a, a pretty strong partnership and, um, and you kind of know what they want and, and they know what your capabilities are. And so it actually, I think, ends up providing really better patient care. Um, everyone's safe and, um, and everyone is allowed to practice at their scope and we really provide good patient care this way. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the issue of safety because that's the next topic I wanted to um, I wanted to get all of your perspectives on. I think now that um, th there is so much in the lay press about safety and avoiding medical errors. I mean, it's a huge issue, and and probably once a year there's a 60 minutes episode on on avoiding medical errors, the cost of medical errors, and safety. We now have gone to an electronic medical record, um, and so all of the information is there. The requirements of the electronic medical record, largely for the, uh, for the financial aspects of and regulatory aspects of medicine, are fairly intense. Um, and I, I think one of, the, one of the tremendous things that the NP and the PA brings to the care of, of patients is that added safety, that we have redundancy in the system, we have multiple eyes looking at every uh, radiology report, every laboratory test. Um, I don't know, Meg. Do you do you want to start with that? How do you how do you incorporate that re redundancy in in the cardiac patients, where obviously it's it's so critically important? So it starts first thing in the morning when I walk <coughs> in. In that the our list of patients, I look at all the labs, I look at all the X-rays, I look at the vital signs from the last time I was here. Um, if there's any abnormalities, um, I alert the physicians immediately. Um, that then proceeds down to the intensive care unit where the intensivists review films with us. We go over labs, we round on the patients, and then out on the floor, it's again, there's a, um, a person who's on call at night who is also reviewing things that aren't done, that we've ordered, they catch up on things. So um, there's many people along the way, and the nurses and everyone else along the way are very helpful in all of that, yeah. too. Sarah, also from the inpatient side, any helpful little tidbits and, and uh, hints maybe for, for the very young PA who's thinking about a career in, in the hospital. I think the EMR system has like revolutionized how we take care of patients. I mean, it's just amazing. When, um, when I first started, we actually didn't have an EMR system and you would have to come in and like read the, the patient chart that physically. Was it was handwritten. So you yeah. had to try to figure out what someone was writing and, and then read through it. So there was a, a lot of prep that went into to your rounds in the morning and now everything is electronic so I can essentially check on my patients from my house, from my phone, which is, which is just amazing. Mm -hmm. I think it's just another level of care that we're providing and um, the ability to look and see that something's unusual and, and call and talk to the nurse or talk to the patient, I think is just, um, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, Steve, the outpatient environment is arguably even more complicated because if you see, for example, uh, 15 patients this afternoon, mm -hmm. you'll end up with a homework assignment of yeah. pending laboratory studies and pending x-ray reports that might be 10 patients long. Yeah. How, are you, how are you able to, you know, to follow up on that? Well, and, and having worked a little bit in the inpatient world you know, prior to my uh, current position in the outpatient land, I, you know, in the inpatient world, you know, usually the care is, is fairly streamlined and car compartmentalized where you're focusing on one or two major issues. In the outpatient world, there's many more patients going on at the same time, um, and you're, you're working to make sure that um, the information that you're documenting is accurate because, you know, with the electronic medical record comes all these fantastic capabilities, but with that comes complexity and the ability or um, danger of, of having errors if there's not um, you know, accuracy to the chart. So I think PAs and MPs take pride, be it inpatient or outpatient, in making sure that what they're documenting is accurate. Um, because so much of what occurs with communication in our healthcare world occurs in the chart. Uh, it seems like there's less and less direct verbal communication sometimes between providers. And a lot of what we do and how we care for patients takes place in, in, the, in this world of, of the electronic medical record. So 
making sure that what you're communicating is accurate um, helps other providers do their job better as well because they understand what you're doing and thinking and then they can augment what they're doing for the patient more effectively as well. So it, I think it's incredibly important and there are days when there are a number of patients and you have to spend the time to be accurate and maybe that means you're taking some of the work home with you. But again, the beauty of being able to do that is you can sit at home and, and complete the work and follow up on those patients and make sure that what you're doing um, is really the best of your ability for the patient. Great. Well, maybe my, la my last uh, uh, request would be a comment from all of you about working here at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And, and Sarah, I know that you, uh, you also teach at Marquette. Mm -hmm. And hopefully all the students who listen to your lectures <laughs> will want to join our Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin. But maybe uh, for those um, uh, for those young men and women who are in NP or PA school or thinking about it, um, one or two words on uh, why they should definitely do this. Well, I started here, I think, about eight years ago, and, um, and I chose to work at an academic institution because the learning just never stops. It's so easy. There's just so many things you can attend, and um, this is an academic learning center. So we have residents and students, and the focus is is continuing to to learn and expand your knowledge. And it just seemed like the most natural place to be. Um, nothing's ever stagnant. You're always learning and growing, which I think is just a really important aspect of um, of being a PA and an NP. Great. Meg? For me, it's been the flexibility. I uh, have four children. Um, I was able to work um, through all of them. Um, I have a husband who works many long hours, and if his job hours changed, I was able to either try a different job, um, and there was always the availability to try something like that. I just think there's a the flexibility. Plus, for me, um, the medical college and the division of surgery have been a great employee, employer. Wonderful. Steve? I can agree with Meg in saying that, you know, the college has always been um, fantastic with providing flexibility with work-life balance, but um, uh, on Sarah's note as well, I think practicing at an institution where you know that you're always sort of at the forefront of providing, you know, the top-notch medical care, not only in the region, but, um, you know, all over, um, it gives us a lot of pride to be working with people side by side. and. Um, one of the things I've been most impressed with is just how supportive the medical college is with the advanced practice providers, providing an administrative team that um, looks out for our best interests and advocates for us. Um, and that's important in a profession or professions that are still developing a foothold and, and, uh, and exposure in the healthcare world. So to have the feeling that what we do is respected and supported um, is an incredible feeling, and I don't know if there's many other institutions around that would provide that level of support. Great. Well, thank you all very much. I think um, uh, Steve, Meg, and Sarah provide uh, a, a wonderful little insight uh, into the 60 uh, nurse practitioners and PAs that work in the Department of Surgery, and we're so lucky to have all three of you and, uh, and all of your colleagues. And thank you all for watching. Certainly, if you have more questions regarding uh, how to become a nurse practitioner or a PA, or if you're a patient or a family member uh, and you have uh, questions with regard to how we make up our medical care team, there'll be information to, to, to call or write at the end of this video. Thanks very much for listening and watching.